and now I'd like to introduce Yoshi Kato. He's an assistant professor at Tokyo Christian University where he teaches history and religious philosophy. He's recently earned a PhD from Princeton Seminary in the United States. His dissertation is on Spinoza's radical concept of God and the 17th century Dutch theologian's reaction to it. His research interest consists in the early modern intersections among theology, philosophy, and science. This is not my slide, so I'm not sure. <laughs> So with that great, gracious assistant of uh, uh, should be helping me to turn click. So let me let me start. Philip Melanchthon can be described as the chief of staff for Martin Luther's Reformation. What happened? Can you, can you <laughs> as Luther boldly started. The historic movement of Protestantism, Melanchthon gave a, a, a clear shape to it. His contribution to the Reformation is not limited to the religious and theological texts, such as the Augsburg Confession, which is a famous one from 1530, but also a number of university textbooks that laid a foundation for the confessionalization of Protestant territories in the mid to the late 16th century. With the university textbooks, Melanchthon reintroduced Aristotle's works, and especially the ethics. In the early stage of the Reformation, Luther, heavily influenced by Erasmus and in Northern Humanism, wanted to get rid of scholastic Aristotle from the university curriculum. But by the late 1520s and early 30s, Melanchthon, with the full backing of, of Luther, reintroduced Aristotle's works without excluding his ethics which contain the greatest theological problems for Protestants. Along with it, Melanchthon's, uh, his own political and ethical teachings goes through a major shift. For example, in his earlier edition of the Lotsi Communis, uh, Melanchthon following Erasmus endorses Platonic notion of social equality and the common good. But by the 1530s, Melanchthon rejects this Platonic teaching and introduces Aristotelian notion of distributive justice, which permits social inequality and difference. A number of scholars, as I listed here, locate this shift in Melanchthon's first-hand experience of social uprisings and instability in the uh, 1520s and 30s. In this presentation, I shall focus on Melanchthon's reaction to the peasants' war in particular of 1525, as well as to his subsequent textbook of Aristotle's ethics to see how his teaching of social order has changed and shifted. Melanchthon has written three texts on the topic of the peasants' war. We shall briefly examine two of them. The first one, entitled Refutation of the Twelfth Article of the Peasants, which is listed here was written sometime between May 18th and June 7th of 1525, immediately after the war. This work is Melanchthon's point-by-point -point refutation of the peasants' 12 articles. In it, he argues for the inviolable nature of political authority, which is the government, as well as the, the divine order regarding social matter. In this introduction, Melanchthon uh, repeatedly denounces the peasants' action. The peasants, having the name of the gospel and the love of God, acted contrary to the divine will. He argues that violence cannot possibly be part of the divine plan for civil society. Quoting from 1 Timothy of the New, Tem uh, New Testament, Melanchthon argues that the requir requirement of God's law is to have love from, from a pure heart, 
good conscience and true faith. So with faith, they can act toward God and with love toward neighbor and government. Thus he argues that the, the gospel requires people to obey their government all, at all times. Any opposition against the government that therefore is considered as murderous, and God does not leave murderers unpunished, he argues. In the first article, the peasants argue that the gospel requires each community to select its own pastor. So the government's depriving the sacred right justifies the peasants' uprising, and their rebellion in turn functions as a divine punishment against the godless rulers, they are peasants argue. Melanchthon puts the main issue of the selection of the pastor aside and simply attacks the peasants' action against the legitimate authority of the government. Melanchthon regards any given government to be part of God's cosmic order, and thus the people ought to accept the present condition even if rulers do not allow the people to choose their own pastors. Therefore, the peasants violate God's cosmic order by revolting against the legitimate authority. In the second article, the peasants insist on the right to have their own local pastor supported by their tithe or taxes, rather than send their tithe to, uh, to a distant land, which was a common practice of the day. In response, Melanchthon again argues that people are obliged to do whatever the earthly government institutes. Since it is legitimate for, for government to impose tithe, it is the government's right, not the peasants, to send the tithe and tax as, as they desire, as the government desires. So what is Melanchthon's reason for the priority of political authority over the people in these two articles? He simply states that, that God has created animals to be free, but man must belong to world, worldly authority, he says. In other words, a so social order is part of God's cosmic, order, cosmic design. Thus, rejecting a government and defining its jurisdiction, Melanchthon says, is a robbery. According to Melanchthon, opposing government is against the moral principle or natural law, he even says, found in human conscience, so the peasant's claim can never be justified. In other words, even when the temporal authority has wronged, the proper function of human conscience should bid them to submit to the government. Melanchthon's concept of social order and the role of government was not always the same. In the earlier treatment of the natural law, for example, in his 1521 Lothi, Lothi, the civil magistrate is understood as necessary evil, that the, the political authority was necessary evil in the fallen world, subservient to more important principles such as nobody must be harmed and the goods to be shared, so the notion of common good here. But by, in his uh, 1543 last edition of Lothi, that un unconditional obedience to, uh, to civil authority occupies the first place of the natural law, thus reflecting Melanchthon's view in 1525. So by, by 40, it's quite different. Let us turn to Melanchthon's refutation of the 12 articles. In his response to the article 3 to 12, Melanchthon establishes theologically the political rights of the temporal authority over the peasants. There's no time to examine each point carefully, but Melanchthon basically argues that the peasants are to submit to the government since it is part of God's cosmic order. Again, the same argument. At the end of, of his refutation, Melanchthon attaches an appendix which calls rulers to their general duties in, in order to establish justice and to, and to nurture the youth rightly. Melanchthon commands that rulers establish schools where people can be taught in Christian teachings and other disciplines of learning. In addition, he argues that government should implement the proper preaching of the word of God and they establish the church order. So with teaching of the school and the church order, that, that people uh, can be submit, uh, sub become submissive to the government. So after the peasants' war, Melanchthon follows his own call and aligns his teaching to establish the civil justice, strict order of the government and people. Let us turn to the second writing. So this, this book, soon after the publication of the last writing, Melanchthon prepares 24 theses on the issue of civil justice. This is conducted in June 23rd, 1525, University of Edinburgh. In this dis disputation, he develops the distinction between the political or the worldly, authority, uh, worldly justice and divine justice. The clear conceptual difference between the two types of justice opened the room for the use of Aristotelian philosophy, particularly his ethics and politics. In this 
this dissertation, uh, Melanchthon argues that God demands from human beings external and political justice. Just as it is demanded from a tree, he uses analogy, to bear good fruit, so it is demanded from human rationality or soul the power and faculty to do political justice. This justice or righteousness belongs to their natural power, just as nature to produce fruit exists in trees. However, some think the world worldly justice or that this civil justice results from God immediately. This is what the peasants argued as they demanded the strict application of divine justice in the political realm. Against this opinion, Melanchthon argues that God only demands civil, civil justice, not divine justice, divine justice from people in the political realm. Melanchthon argues here that because of the natural capability to achieve political justice, people, people do not need to, need to turn to the Bible or the gospel to, to justify their, their political demands. Rather, they simply need to be guided by education and governmental discipline. In other words, Jesus' teaching of love and freedom should not be applied in the political realm, Melanchthon argues. From what has, been, what, what, what has been discussed, I shall point out two things. First, Melanchthon clearly distinguishes political justice from divine justice, as, as we have seen. The latter can only be attained by faith, that divine justice, that is, and it is applicable only in the spiritual, not political realm. In his earlier works, such as the 1521 Lozi, Melanchthon shows much more willingness for the application of the gospel, or the divine justice, to, divine justice to social issues. Melanchthon now sees a clear distinction between the two realms of justice. The second, as a part of God's cosmic order, government is designed to maintain political peace. Christians, therefore, must submit to the will of the government, and even to extent to endure suffering which is common practice by back then. Here, Melanchthon's early Platonic emphasis on equality or the sharing of the goods subsides, and the government's role as a sustainer of so-called peace and order, in turn, gets heavily emphasized. Finally, regarding the issue of political justice, Melanchthon now turns to Aristotle for the notion of distributive justice, which he finds particularly helpful to formulate the structure of God's social order. Let's now turn to his, his use of Aristotle's ethics. After the social chaos created by the peasants' war, Ernest in Saxony uh, organized a visitation in the summer of 1527. In accordance with the lecturer's order, the Lenten personally visited during the where the Thomas Münzer, the revolt was. Sometime before the visitation, he continued to develop the concept of political justice as he lectured on Cicero's death. Theopikis, which, which deals about that first century Roman revolt. In August 1527, Melanchthon also published a short, short disputation on Colossians 2.8, which he affirms the positive use of philosophy by making the rigid and clear distinction between philosophy and faith. Melanchthon also began to lecture on, on Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics for the first time in 1527-28. He published the result of these lectures in 1529, dealing only with the first two, book, two books of ethics. He also published a commentary on Aristotle's politics in the 1530s. In addition to the commentary on, on Aristotle's works, Melanchthon also wrote a summary of textbook, Epitome, Epitome um, on, on ethics, for the use of the students in Protestant universities. Along uh, among all the editions of Melanchthon's textbook in ethics, the oldest one dates from uh, December 1532. The historical development of textbook is, is very interesting. But more importantly, the question must be asked, why did Melanchthon reinstate Aristotle's ethics, which was so hated by Luther and Robinson initially, in the university curriculum? The last section of the paper will focus on the particular concept, which I argue is a key to Melanchthon's Aristotle's ethics, Melanchthon's use of Aristotle's ethics. The concept elaborated in, in this epitome or the survey of ethics is distributive justice. Elaborating on Aristotle's account, uh, Melanchthon defines distributive justice as being concerned um, with unequal transaction among disproportionate degree or status of people in society. 
This notion of distributive justice is one of the focal points of Melanchthon's summary of Aristotle's ethics. In his letter to Le uh, Leonard von, von Eck of Bavaria on October 18, uh, 1535, Melanchthon tells him that Book 5 of Nicomachean Ethics, which deals with the distributive justice, plays a key role in Aristotle's ethics. Melanchthon initially did not see the value of Aristotle, nor understood the concept of distributive justice, as he just tells in this letter. But as he compared it with the fifth book of Plato's Laws, which deals with abolishment of private property, he began to see the importance of Aristotle and his concept of politics. As, as we have seen above uh, or before, earlier in 1521, Melanchthon cites Plato's notion of the common property as the ideal of society, as we remember. He thinks its actual realization is not possible due to sin or the fall, but he sees it as a direction that society should move toward with the help of the gospel or the Christian law. In the aftermath of, of the peasants, who I should say, Melanchthon takes from Book 5 of Aristotle's Ethics the central role of the geometric proportion, which is a key to the concept of distributive justice. Distributive justice, in, in turn, legitimizes inequality, both in private and public realms of, of social relations, namely government and family. So in both cases, that the hierarchy becomes much, much more rigid in its set. In all social relations, distributive justice takes, takes into account the degrees of persons, uh, greatest personality. Uh, regarding redistribution in society, the degree of persons, rather than equality, must be considered basically the, the social hierarchy, you know, the class distinction. In other words, the concept of distributive justice philosophically establishes a disproportionate social relation among constituents by affirming the status quo of ontologically and ethically hierarchical relations. This notion of distributive justice, therefore, functions as an ammunition of the ruling class against those who claim natural equality based on the gospel as the peasants have done. In this presentation, I attempted to show, uh, uh, rather quickly perhaps, a conceptual connection between Melanchthon's reaction to the Peasants' War and his use of Aristotle's ethics. In light of socially catastrophic event of the Peasants' War, Melanchthon formulates his socio-political teaching first to strengthen the power of government, and second to utilize the concept of distributive justice to defend social inequality. After this ideological shift, the gospel of Christ's love no longer could be applied to the social realm, but was restricted to the spiritual and private realm. Melanchthon's thought became foundational as a result to the subsequent confessionalization of the Protestant territories because it was, it was read in the university, Protestant universities. Of course, the work needs to be elaborated and details filled, built, but I present it to you as a material for further discussion. And thank you for attention. Very much. Questions?
So the political justice that, that I'm talking about here, and the, the particular word that he uses is justitia carnali, or that the civili. So that's the Latin word of it. So like civil justice or, or carnal, that, 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 that physical, or that the bodily justice, that, that's what he uses. Um, here about the web Washington uses the concept of distributed justice for that purpose. Yeah. Um, is he relying on his predecessor in, in that use? Is he, in is, he, is he reading, you know, that was question, is he reading someone else? Yes, 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 for that purpose. Yeah, it's, it's okay for in for quite different context, but yeah. in that direction. Uh, thanks for that very good question. I th no, I think this this discovery is actually something that he himself is conducting. Like in, in the in the midst of this social chaos, especially in the 1526-27, as as a result of the Peasants' War, he begins to read Cicero on his own. He begins to read, and for for, for that matter, Aristotle's Ethics, which was basically a, it wasn't officially banned, but, but Luther and others didn't want people to read Ethics. So it is. Doubtful. I mean, I, I got to do a much more thorough um, investigation, but but it is unlikely that he's reading someone's commentary on it in, in, in that in that capacity. So he's reading that, and obviously he's, he's, he's influenced by that Renaissance turning of, of Aristotelianism. That's for sure. But but this concept, particular concept, and his uses and application of this concept in the political realm is something that that he himself uh, comes up with. Um, was there no evidence that he um, consulted as a person in his private spheres or interactions? Is there no um, other person who is, um, with which we like to can discuss such matter at the Aristotelian basis? So, uh, so he, I, I know that for sure he, he knew some of the Italian, uh, Padawan, Aristotelians, and he, he, he's read some of their works. But particularly on this, this topic, because the Protestantism itself really restricted the use of, of, of ethics and political works of, of Aristotle, I, I'm, I'm, I think I am arguing, and along with people like Frinja Franca and, and, and uh, Dr. Skrava, that it, these series of political events really pushed him to reconsider some of the works in, in, in light of this. Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering uh, if uh, how much the Melanchthon's Aristotelian uh, uh, sorry, justice is uh, Aristotelian is my question. Yeah. Because uh, uh, for Aristotle, Aristotle uh, justice is a virtue that is a character of the person, not, not the social relation. That is a very crucial point, the difference between uh, ancient uh, justice and uh, modern justice, right. I think. Yeah. Um, I think that the, uh, the what kind of, uh, 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 for example, you, you stress on the uh, power of government, but ironically, uh, ancient police has no police because there is no re uh, re uh, regulating power. You, you're talking about like ancient police that's not imperial. You know, the police? So in, in personal base. Pol uh, police, like police. Police. Uh, police. Yeah. Uh, uh, cop. Cop, yeah. <laughs> there's no. Uh -huh. <laughs> there's no. Uh, ancient right. person, right. no police. Sure. So uh, uh, people uh, uh, resolve some uh, uh, problems or struggles uh, must be solu uh, solved by personal base, in personal basis. So, the virtue of personal uh, character is stressed by Plato as well as Aristotle uh, is yeah. very important because that is not a problem of the power but of the education. So, uh, how about the Melanchthon? The justice is a virtue or some social order or some something like the political matter? I think and that is I'm wondering the how much 
the boundaries of ACP and just is, is as ACP. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Great question. Um, so the, the notion of, of uh, Bayesian inequality is Justice as virtue is, is something that Thomas already talked about in, 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 in medieval times. So it's not foreign to the, the Christian context. But the reason why Luther disliked the ethics is because it was considered to be that the virtuous, you grow into the righteousness, right? And so Luther, Luther thought righteousness is basically, basically a divine and foreign and alien righteousness. You don't earn it, you don't, you don't work toward it. So, so even in the Melanchthons, as he revives and reinstates Aristotle, he doesn't want to go that, that route. I don't think he wants to go the virtue, uh, justice as virtue, justice as something that people personally accomplish, but more objectively, the social relationship between these different ranks and class of people, that the prince and then the educated ranks and the peasants, and then, then that, that distributive justice, which he, he uses geometric portions, which, which is our so Aristotelian work, but I don't know how much our, the real Aristotelian that is. But he uses that concept to distinguish and differentiate the different class of people so that, that you can justify that stuff that God, God gave them order. So it's more objective thing rather than the, the virtuous and the personal things. And I think that's, that's more, more to do with their theological uh, issues and problems rather than the actual reading of that stuff. So, thank you. Another question? I have thought this is a short one, and it's on the same fashion as the question. Uh, my question would be uh, do you find some kind of um, a specific attack on Aquinas in the in the domain of the of the concept of death of justice in yeah, yeah, and then 15, 15, 18, there's a disputation against the uh, Congress of Philosophers, which Luther does, which is not Thomas Thomas. He, he names Thomas, but, but the person he's attacking is Gabriel Gabriel in like 14th, 15th century scholastic uh, people. But, but their, their adaptation of Thomas and uh, their adaptation of, of ethics is being very much attacked at that time. So, like, in, in uh, late teens, when the Reformation is about to take take place, what they're attacking is this: you know, you grow into righteousness, you grow into justice, and, and then Aristotle was used in that theological term. So that's why they rejected the issue. But because of these political catastrophes, they they returned to that. One last question. So you describe the change of position of Melanchthon um, from Platonist, in a sense, to Aristotelian. And um, was Luther still living at the moment? Or, no. And what was his re Luther's reaction or other Lutherans mm -hmm. about uh, Melanchthon's change of position? So. What what's so smart about Melanchthon? I think oh, thanks, thanks for the question. Smart about Melanchthon is that, that he's not touching theology at all. So he's basically having two different realms, like one divine justice and political justice, are two different things. So in order for for us to be justified and be righteous before God, that's that's totally different matter. That's still the proto Protestant uh, Lutheran teaching. So there he's maintaining that, but but he's saying that. You cannot apply that thinking, theological teaching, to the political realm as the peasants tried to do, or the other Anabaptists tried to do, right? They, they wanted to see the gospel and the love of Christ being, being penetrating into social relations mm -hmm. so that there will be no more serfdoms, mm -hmm. there'll, there'll be no more feudal, feudal mm -hmm. orders because you can't chain your brother, in, in that kind of thing. So Melanchthon is saying that those two things are distinguished. And, and, and you can be ju just and righteous before God spiritually, but politically, those are different questions. Mm -hmm. So Luther really, you know, he thought this was a great, great thing as well, too. So they, they're supporting that. And as a university curriculum, I think that's what, that's what they wanted to move toward. Theology is quite different from any other mm -hmm. disciplines, whereas before it was much more, more encompassing. So. Thank you.
Let's please thank uh, Joshi for his wonderful